Really excited to be here. This is my first webinar. So congratulations to all of you for being part of this moment. Um, and uh, I guess really quickly, I'd love to know if anyone could just type into the chat box. I'm really curious to know if anyone is one already growing nut trees and two, where you're calling in from. So you can do that um, over the course of the webinar if you'd like, or, or just right now. But as a quick introduction, um, as Laura said, my name is Sam Bosco. I am a PhD candidate at Cornell University in the horticulture department. And I'm focusing my PhD on how growing nut trees in New York State can help contribute to climate smart agriculture. Um, and I'm just going to get started. So firstly, to begin, Um, just like to acknowledge that all of New York, most of New York State is um, indigenous territory, the Haudenosaunee, and this um, and this is actually is very relevant to the study and the production of nuts, as I'll show later on in the presentation. How um, indigenous peoples throughout thousands of years um, in what is today New York State have actually managed the forests here for increased nut production as well as other foods as well. Um, but agroforestry is an indigenous technology that we are building off of today and we have the opportunity to continue to foster a relationship with indigenous communities um, and really create an agricultural system that not only is really good for our ecology as well as for our communities but also uh, actually con contributes towards social justice. And I'll, I'll touch on this a bit more um, in a little bit. But first I want to talk about why, why nuts? Why am I so excited about nuts and why should you be excited about nuts or maybe presumably why you already are? Uh, first of all, they are regionally adapted. They have been on this landscape for thousands of years and so have an amazing ability to really um, be resilient to the climate changes that we're experiencing now and are just very right for the kinds of soils and temperature patterns that we have. And they're foods that have been, have stood the test of time. Secondly, as perennial crops that require relatively very little um, in the way of um, pesticides and other kinds of agricultural chemicals, they can, um, help enhance ecosystem services really well. And let me um, stop my video and actually show you the presentation. Um, yeah, so I was saying that nut trees can actually really help support ecosystem services, including beneficial insects as, as well as carbon sequestration, um, soil health, many other, many other aspects like that. And as, as I just said, um, nut trees being perennial crops, especially tree crops and are long lived, have this amazing ability to uh, sequester carbon in our landscapes. The Nature Conservancy just came out with a study, which I'll touch on a bit at the end of my uh, presentation, showing how including trees in, in agricultural landscapes can help contribute to uh, what they call natural climate solutions, which can actually help um, achieve 37% of the mitigation power that we need to, to stop climate change. So not only can we, we can produce food, but we can also help mitigate climate change at the same time. They also are just incredible, incredible foods. Um, and they make also really amazing food products, value added products. Um, multiple clinical studies have continued to show that increased consumption of nuts can help reduce all kinds of um, health issues such as risk of cancer, uh, reduced risk of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and actually help increase your, the longevity of your life. So not only are these plants good for our ecosystems and good for our landscapes, but they're also really good for us and our communities, our people. Um, as I'll touch on a little bit later, there's a really vibrant and amazing indigenous legacy as well as indigenous future with, with nut trees. Um, this picture here is from a, a nut processing and cooking workshop I did at the Tuscarora Reservation. And um, I'll touch on more about that in a little bit. And then also something that's really exciting is that here in central New York, there is a just newly formed nut producers cooperative that is looking for new members. Um, and they are 
really interested and excited to sustainably grow nut trees, specifically um, hybrid hazelnuts and hybrid chestnuts, um, and create a whole new industry off of this really amazing, well, off of these very amazing crops. This is just a little bit of a background on what I'm focusing on for my PhD research. So I'm doing, I kind of have these three major questions. One of which is looking at the historical importance of nut trees in New York State. So it's looking back through archaeological records, ethnographic evidence, and archival documents, and looking at how nut trees were important in the past. I'm also really interested in, in kind of the social network of people who are growing nut trees today, and, and also the organizations that are really critical in creating um, a sustainable nut production industry in the state today. And then finally, I'm actually, I'll be doing some agricultural experiments on how, on um, some best management practices for growing hybrid hazelnuts and hybrid chestnuts specifically in New York State. So these are being done in Varna and also looking to create um, a kind of a statewide suitability map and, and hopefully a roadmap for what it would mean for there to be a, a, a nut industry in the state. And when we talk about nut trees, we actually have a lot of options. There are over 20 different species of nuts present um, in the landscape today. Um, and these are what well, they are. 16 of these species uh, are, come from the oak family. We have the American chestnut, which is today is functionally extinct, but they're, um, we'll talk a little bit more about hybrids that are uh, very useful in planting today. We have two different species of walnuts. Um, hazelnuts and, and uh, all six species of hickories are edible in different, in different ways. I'll really, for this talk, we'll be, be focusing on hybrid hazelnuts and chestnuts, but we will talk a little bit about other opportunities as well. So this is uh, a little bit about the very deep history of nut trees in this landscape. This is kind of what this area looked like about 10,000 years ago as the glaciers were retreating. This is the end of the Pleistocene or the beginning of the Holocene era. And what you see here is um, right now it's an open landscape where there are no trees, but within uh, 4,000 years from that, so as, as early as 6,000 years ago, we see um, from pollen core records that um, if you look down here in these green boxes, I've underlined the plant families of trees that produce nuts and they have and their pollen is present in this area as early as 6,000 years ago. So these trees, we have evidence that these trees have been pollinating and growing in the Northeast for at least 6,000 years from before present. It's pretty astounding. So when I say that these are regionally adapted, they've been here, they've seen, they've seen changes in the landscape that we can't even imagine. And alongside this, um, people have been, you know, nuts are incredible, incredible foods, have such high um, caloric value, nutritional value, that all people have been, you know, very interested in them for a long time. And so we have really amazing evidence too. Um, over here in this, in this quadrant, we're looking at uh, pictures of stone tools that were uncovered at an archeological site um, in, near Lamoka Lake, which is just a few lakes to the west of Cuba Lake in New York State. Uh, these are estimated to be from about, you know, 3000 BC or about 5000 years ago. And there is uh, other also uncovered here were gigantic acorn roasting beds as well as um, hickory nutshells and black walnut nutshells. We have a little bit more recent. This is a 20th century painting by a Seneca artist depicting um, harvesting chestnuts. So this legacy and this tradition of, 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 um, yeah, of eating nut trees it also spans thousands and thousands of years. We also have a lot of evidence indicating this map here is a, a range map of the, black, of the natural range of black walnut. And you see these very interesting um, circles across the midline of New York State. And these also happen to line up with major sediment sites the five nations of the Haudenosaunee. And so we have some evidence as well as some other evidence that shows that Native Americans of uh, many different nations were planting and managing forests to increase the, the prevalence of nut trees in landscapes. So we call these anthropogenic landscapes. And 
And um, thinking about how this can happen today, we look to a field called decolonial ecology to bring together social justice as well as um, sustainable agriculture. And then over here, some scenes, uh, some pictures from workshops I've done at the Tuscarora Nation where even still today, um, interests and knowledge about processing, growing, eating nut trees is still alive and well and very vibrant. Um, and I've had really amazing um, collaborations um, with folks at Tuscarora. And here are just um, a couple of, of titles from um, peer-reviewed journals showing how there's evidence that really shows that Native Americans, uh, again, from many different parts of the country or even parts of the world, have intentionally and actively managed forests to increase both uh, nut and fruit trees um, across all of North America. There's evidence here from Chautauqua County, New York. Um, this, we're talking more globally here at the, um, in the Amazon. And then this uh, last year, this, um, this paper came out about how not only, you know, is there this indigenous legacy of indigenous management, but also how this management is really tightly tied with um, biodiversity goals and ecosystem service goals. So this is just gives so much more to so much credence and evidence to how we can really be bringing together these two different things sustainable agriculture and social justice specifically with a focus on, on indigenous peoples um since the colonization by europeans of of what is today north america we have seen a decline not only a decline in the forests um so here this is what a forest cover was looked like in about 1850 and it's all time low here in 1930 in some parts of New York State less than 5% of the of the uh, land was was forested all this was cleared for agriculture um, and now today what we have is we have a lot of these uh, open fields that are starting to regenerate sort of wildly with forests and this is an opportunity where we can actually guide this regeneration using these kinds of nut trees to create, and a lot of times these um, these these fields that are that are being regenerated are the least productive or the most marginal, the hardest for large scale equipment. Often are on hillsides or erosion prone land, and these are actually really really great um, low hanging fruit areas to begin planting nut trees. As a result of all of this, the Northeast has been sort of this vacant area um, in terms of interests and interest in nuts, at least compared to the rest of the country. Um, almost every other region of the country has a lot of uh, nut production going on in other ways. A lot of it is really working with um, European plant material, whether it's Turkish hazelnuts being grown in Oregon or pistachios and almonds and English walnuts being grown in California. The South is really unique in that um, the, the the pecans are one of the one of the only native nut tree only, one of the only U.S. native nut trees that are have any kind of commercial importance. Um, and in in the south southern Midwest, there is a a niche crop of of um, black walnuts. But we have an opportunity here in the Northeast and the Upper Midwest to also produce um, especially hazelnuts and chestnuts, which is really what we'll all be focusing on. And I'd like to also um, talk about the, the way in which that we think about planting these crops is really important because we don't want to be repeating the mistakes that agriculture has been um, doing for so long. And that's one thing that really excites me about nut trees is that they offer a really powerful opportunity to reimagine what agriculture can look like. Um, this, this is a, a, a right here, a, a title from a peer reviewed journal authored by um, Tom Molnar is a really amazing um, faculty member at Rutgers University who's been doing astounding work on breeding hazelnuts. And I'll talk a little bit more about the work he's doing in a little bit, but talking this, this notion of tree crops, a permanent agriculture really comes, this, this, this phraseology of it comes from the 1920s with um, Tree Crops, the book written by J. Russell Smith talking about 
how we can use our marginal lands planted to perennial crops like trees to feed not only humans, but also our livestock in ways that are much more sustainable than what's being currently done. And this is also building off of uh, really inspiring work from the Midwest at the Land Institute where they are trying to create perennial grains, modeling a, um, mo trying to create a, a grain-based agriculture modeled after the, the prairie in, and that's under a system called natural systems agriculture. In the Northeast, we have forests, not prairie. And so we can, we can use nut trees as well as other crops as well, other trees and, 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 perennial, and perennial plants to create an agroforestry system where we have forests that look like farms and farms that look like forests at the same time. And these are some of the techniques people are using to, to actually implement this um, tree crop systems or agroforestry. Um, you can have alley cropping. We have rows of trees in between very high value annual crops. Um, these can be timber trees, but we, they can also be food producing trees. This photo is from France. You can also have forest farming where you're growing a crop underneath the canopy of trees and often that works really well for mushrooms or medicinal plants. Windbreaks and riparian buffers um, can be used both for conservation purposes as well as production purposes and can really help reduce energy costs and other sort of externalities. Here's an example down here in this left hand corner of riparian buffer where we're truly really trying to protect stream and water quality from the adjacent uh, more high input and very leaky in terms of nutrients and, and contaminants, uh, agriculture. And then we can also graze animals underneath the, underneath the canopy of trees, which is really good for the animals. And also we can, um, it, it improves animal health, creates better uh, animal products, and we can also harvest a tree crop as well. So really kind of trying to stack as many functions at the same time. And so with that, I'm going to talk a lot more in detail about two very exciting trees that are being really um, explored and advanced here in the Northeast as well as other, other places. And so we're gonna be looking at hybrid chestnuts and hybrid hazelnuts for agroforestry in New York State. So before we get into the nitty gritties about each of these crops, the really most important thing that you need to do if you're, if you're thinking about which kinds of plants are going to be useful on your land is to really know um, your USDA hardiness zone in your area where you plan on planting these, if you're going to plan on plant, planting these. And the USDA hardiness zone tells you about the, um, the annual extreme minimum temperature. So this is like the coldest it will ever, is on average will ever get in your area. This is very important because these, these very low temperatures can kill plants. And so we wanna plant, we wanna choose plant material that's able to withstand sort of the absolute worst case scenario. Um, you see most of New York State is in zone five and six, uh, Adirondacks regions, um, venture into the fours and threes, and then down in like you know, Long Island and the kind of the metropolitan area, we are able to even get up into the sevens. And so this will, imp this will actually um, impact which, which kinds, which cultivars and which species you choose. And then also you want, um, if you don't already know about the Web Soil Survey, it's a really, really great free tool by the USDA. Um, it's not, it, it can be a little bit funky to get used to using, but once you get the hang of it, um, it's, it's very, very powerful. And really the most important things here is to know your soil pH and your soil texture. And we'll, we'll talk about um, how that fits into this um, in sh very shortly. So first of all, chestnuts come from all over the world. There's chestnuts on um, many different continents. In the United States, or what I say, the United States, we have two different species, one, the American chestnut, and then we also have the Allegheny chinkapin, which is a more of a shrub and makes a very like blueberry sized um, ch chestnut. Um, there's several Asian species and there's also a European species. And the ones that are in bold here are the ones that are the most co commercially important today worldwide. And it's also very important to note that um, that chestnuts are wind pollinated and they readily form hybrids between these different species. And that's how we are able to grow chestnuts in the United States today. We'll talk a little bit more about that soon. So very basically, 
is very simple um, growing requirements to, to growing chestnuts. So as you all, as you all probably know, um, that early in the 20th century, a, a disease from Asia, the, the chestnut blight came, it's a, a fungal disease, I'll talk about that more too. Um, and, and in the span of about 40 years, killed some like 3 billion trees. And now as a result, the American chestnut is functionally extinct. However, Asian species have been, um, have been co-evolving with this fungal disease, with this fungus in Asia for many, for thousands and thousands of years. And so we're able to grow Asian species and their hybrids here um, in this part of the world. So looking, and so the, right, the, the most important thing you wanna do when you plant chestnuts is to make sure that you're choosing a blight resistant cultivar. And those are really gonna be come from the Chinese, which is Castanea mollissima, or the, the Korean Castanea crenata. And they're also hybrids of them. They can also hybridize with the European chestnut. The European chestnut um, by itself is susceptible to the chestnut blight, but it's very useful as, um, as a component within hybrid systems. For the, in terms of soil, really one of the most important things is to have really good drainage. And so you also want to make sure that your soil is not too high in clay because this will probably reduce the kind of drainage that you have. Drain, having well-drained soil is really important because chestnuts are, very, are susceptible to phytophthora root rot. Um, but if your soils are well-drained, you won't really have a problem. If they, are, if they have drainage issues, there are ways to deal with that. You can plant them on mounds. Um, that's sort of an advanced technique that I'm not really covering that in depth here, but I can help point you to resources after that afterwards. And also chestnuts love acidic soil between five and a half and six and a half pH is ideal. Anything above 6.8 is likely to kill your tree. Um, and anything below that also the tree, tree will suffer. In terms of choosing a site, it's really great to have good frost drainage. So having, if you have sloping land or, or a hill, that can be really, really great. Um, when they're dormant in the winter, they can tolerate temperatures as low as negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And as I said, slopes work really well for chestnuts. Um, in terms of water, after they're established, they're very, very drought tolerant and don't really require irrigation, though it doesn't hurt. Um, and in the early stages of the, of the early stages of your orchard establishment, micro irrigation works really well. To start off, you you want you want to plant your trees about twenty feet apart, and then by the time they reach maturity, these these trees can have very large spreading crowns about up to sixty five feet in diameter. So you may need to, you know, by year twenty five, even thin your um, orchard to so trees are spaced um, actually forty by forty. When thinking about planting chestnut trees, we have kind of two different options. We have the choice to either plant seedlings or clonal cultivars. Um, and so here are the different considerations and you'll, you'll get to make the choice yourself if you choose to plant these. So for seedlings, seedlings are very affordable. They can be free if you collect the nuts yourself and sprout them yourselves and plant them yourselves. Or they can be also still very much on the low end, probably you know, five to seven dollars a tree. They're very quick to establish compared to grafts. And they offer, and they have, as a result of being a seedling, they, have, they are genetically very diverse. And this can work both you know, in your favor as well as be a challenge. So on the challenging side, when these are ready to actually start producing nuts, the genetic diversity um, will create trees that yield at different times and trees that yield different, different amounts. They'll also vary in their survivability or the resistance to um, the chestnut blight. It's also, you'll have to, when planting, when, if, you're gonna, if you're going to establish a commercial orchard based on seedlings, you'll be doing a lot of culling, a lot of thinning of, of your trees. You probably will want to plant uh, double or quadruple the, um, the spacing that I had originally said, maybe plant a tree every 10 feet and very aggressively cut down trees that either get blight very early or don't produce, you know, to your specifications, to your desires. So you'll be doing thinning and thinning and thinning and lots of replanting 
Um, these are also, if, if you're less concerned with commercial production, these are also a really great option for home plantings because they establish very well and the diversity can be really nice. But after doing lots of thinning and careful selection, they have a really high potential to be useful in commercial plantings. And the picture here comes from a commercial orchard in Ohio that's planted entirely to seedling um, Chinese chestnuts that I visited. One of the other options is looking at grafted cultivars. These are much more expensive, but they come from trees that are known to be good producers. These can be upwards of $15 to $30. I've even seen like $60 per tree, depending on how old they are. So you'll also, as a result, want to be extremely more careful as you establish them, make sure that nothing happens to them. They will yield sooner um, because the, the, the scion that you graft into the rootstock is, the, is at the maturity of the tree that it was taken from. So if that tree was already producing, you know, you could, you could plant a chestnut tree, one uh, graft a chestnut tree, and it, it could yield, you know, it could start producing nuts that year. Whereas with the seedlings, it will take about three to five years for them to start flowering. And then you probably, you won't get, you'll just start getting commercial yields by year six, and then really you'll, you'll be at full production by year 12. One of the really biggest issues with grafted cultivars is that they experience something called delayed graft failure, which is still being understood. But what happens is that there seems to be a genetic incompatibility between the rootstock and the scion. So um, some people are recommending, if you do want to plant grafts, to plant grafts from the same species and the same cultivar. But this can show up five, 10, 15, even 20 years after you've planted the trees. So you may have invested tens of thousands of dollars in an orchard to find that 20 years later, they're just all dead. Um, and it's very variable. And so some people recommend planting grafted cultivars because they offer very consistent production. Um, but it, it seems like if it, personally, I, I don't really recommend it at this point. There's also been some major um, advances in tissue cultured plant material, which I don't have a slide on, but that is, that's becoming more and more a, 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 an option for having clonally propagated cultivars that are on their own roots. And so this, you know, once we have, um, once we have more stock of these, of these micro propagated chestnut trees, this issue will be um, will, will be resolved in many ways. So I guess keep on the lookout too for clone for micro propagated clonal chestnuts. So in terms of production, looking at a final spacing about forty to fifty feet per tree. Again, at at you know after twenty five years, this might be you might want to cut this down to twenty, depending on how crowded they are. You don't want the you don't want the, the branches of the crowns of neighboring trees to overlap because chestnuts, they produce their flowers on the, the newest year's growth. So all the productions on the outer edge of the canopy. This chart here is, um, this comes from the University of Michigan. And Michigan is currently the United States' largest producer of chestnuts. They've been doing a lot of work. And what you see here, are these colored blocks are um, clonally propagated, um, high production cultivars. And these are also, um, the, the, the pollen of these in particular are actually sterile. So they, these trees are primed to really just receive pollen and produce nuts. And then everything in, in gray are, are pollinizers. These are trees that also make good chestnuts, but they also, but their pollen is not sterile. And so they are used to pollinate the, the orchard. And pollination is really important to understand. Um, one, it begins in mid-June, mid to late June. So that's really great because it, it totally escapes a lot of the late frosts that we're experiencing in April and March that have been really problematic for the apple and peach um, growers. Um, what's different about chestnuts is that not only are they wind pollinated, but they're, they're self-incompatible. So, you need multiple cultivars in an orchard in order to actually have production. Some of the, the palm sterile cultivars like Colossal and Bouche de Betazac um, are sterile. In they can't pollinate other trees, but they, can, but they put all their energy into nut production. 
Uh, there is, an, there has been an issue with um, Chinese chestnut trees um, pollinating these, these are European and Japanese hybrids. So Colossal and Ushtabetazak are examples of European and, and um, Japanese hybrids. And if they get pollinated by a, a Chinese tree, they will experience something called internal kernel breakdown, which I'll talk about later. Basically, your nut starts to rot before it actually gets to your consumer's hands. And then you can, at full maturity, you can expect between 2,000 to 3,500 pounds per acre at about 50 trees per acre at a final, final spacing. And so at about, you know, depending on the size uh, of the nuts themselves, and whether or not you're, you're pricing for organic or conventional production, you can be looking at um, you know, five to, five to $8,000 per acre in, in revenue. In terms of um, managing different diseases and challenges with, with chestnuts, the, the most significant one is the chestnut blight. As I said before, is a, is a foreign fungal pathogen come from Asia, first discovered in 1904 in the Bronx Zoo and has really led to the functional extinction of our Native American chestnut, which was a huge loss for everyone um, on the Eastern seaboard. As it, people, you know, quote unquote, uh, were born, born and died by chestnuts. They were either, you know, born into a chestnut made cradle, lived in a house made out of chestnut wood, and died in caskets made of chestnuts, and also ate chestnuts throughout their entire life. Um, today, you know, kind of the upshot of this, you know, uh, uh, an upshot of this sort of this, this uh, globalization. So globalization, unfortunately, brought this disease to us. But an upshot to that is that we can grow the Asian chestnut species, which are naturally resistant to the fungus. To the fungus. Um, and so that's the best the best way to manage against chestnut blight is to grow known cultivars or cultivars that are known to be, you know, fully resistant or really strongly resistant to the blight. So choose time-tested plant material. And then if you do see blight on your farm, just get rid of the plant and make sure you sanitize your tool with alcohol so you don't actually spread it around. The blight is everywhere in our woods. It lives on oak trees. It lives on beech trees. It, we will never be able to get rid of the blight. It's here forever. Um, so this is just something to always be watchful for and to always be selecting against, if, especially if you're using um, a seedling uh, planting stock. Some other diseases to look out for, as I mentioned before, the Phytophthora root rot. Um, this is, uh, it's a soil fungus. It's been reported to be as far north as northern Pennsylvania, but climate change is probably going to bring it uh, further north. It's probably already here. And this is really the mo one of the most important reasons to make sure that you have really good drainage, you have the adequate drainage in your soil and that your soil type is, is one that allows for such drainage. If you do have, if your tree does, if you do see signs that your tree has this disease, your tree is probably already dead. It's, it's very fatal. So it's really important to make sure you match the, your trees to your correct site. Another disease that we're seeing happen is something called blossom end rot. And this is the same, um, caused by the same fungus that causes bitter, um, I think it's called bitter, uh, bitter rot in apples and other uh, stone fruits. And it's, uh, it's, it's possible that it comes from another, uh, another disease that I'll, t I'll talk about in the next slide. You know, helping to improve airflow within your tree canopy can help reduce the incidence of this. So um, making sure you're pruning out dead branches and um, branches that are being shaded out. The exact source of this fungus and, and exactly how to manage it is still being figured out. We have, no, we have seen that some of the, the Japanese cultivars and species, or some of the, the, some of the, some of the cultivars of, Jap, of Japanese species have uh, genetic resistance to uh, blossom end rot. And then also, if you do find it after your harvest, you'll just have, you need to remove those nuts before selling, selling them to the consumer. And here are some pictures of what it looks like. This is uh, here, what it looks like on the shell itself. So you, you can even see it without opening up the nut. And then once you peel the, um, the thin shell off, you can see that this, the end of the, the nut is just rotted. And so these are not, not good for consumption. 
You can feed them to livestock, but you wouldn't want to feed them to people. And then there's two major important um, insect pests for, for chestnuts. One is the Asian chestnut gall wasp, which has not yet been reported in New York State, but it was reported in Michigan in 2017. And it is this little tiny wasp that lays an egg at the um, apical meristem, like the growing, the growing tip of, the, of all the branches, and forms a gall which then distorts the leaves and their buds. Um, and there's a little tiny in, uh, larva on the inside to sort of telling the plant to shunt it, you know, all kinds of resources and, and treats and things. That, and what will happen is since the chestnuts produce flowers on the ends of the newest, uh, newest branch, this, this, uh, the galls basically destroy any kind of future um, flower production, which then also reduces your yield. Um, one thing that's really um, encouraging is that there's been studies by Michigan State University and other places that this parasitic wasp, Tormis sinensis, can be used um, to combat the Asian chestnut gall wasp. So it's really nice to have a non-chemical, bio you know, a biological control method. And we also are seeing some, some cultivars have a genetic resistance. Um, for example, this, this one, Bush de Betazac, is one of those that seems to just be um, resistant naturally to, to the gall wasp. And then probably the biggest um, challenge facing chestnut production are the chestnut weevils. And there's two species of chestnut weevils. Um, and what they do is they, they, um, they fly around, they crawl around, and they lay eggs in the developing nuts as they're just developing. And the larva grows inside, and then they, um, when the nuts fall in, the, in October, the larva hatch and then eat their way out of the nut. And you can see what the grub looks like here. And this is what an uh, the adult weevil looks like. Um, and these are very disgusting to find, especially for consumers who are not used to finding insects in their, um, you know, in their in their produce. Um, right now, there, there, are, there is a chemical that is registered to treat this. It's, um, the name is escaping me at the moment. But it's a, it's, it's a very broad spectrum insecticide. But there's also really good uh, cultural and biological management techniques that we have available to us. Um, so one is to be very vigilant and during harvest time and to pick up every single nut that hits the ground. This way you're interrupting the life cycle of the weevil. So this way that, so what happens is that when the weevil larva crawls out of the ground, it then goes, go, crawls out of the nut, it then goes into the ground, overwinters, and then the next year becomes an adult and then climbs up the tree, lays the egg in the developing nut and repeats the cycle. So if we can reduce the number of larvae that are actually entering the soil, we can keep a very clean orchard floor and interrupt the life cycle of this plant. We can also think about maybe using uh, chickens or other livestock to come in through the orchard after harvest to clean out any grubs. There's also been some really exciting uh, new research done by both Michigan State University and Cornell University about using um, beneficial nematodes in the soil to, to kill the larva as they are overwintering. Um, so this is, this is really great news that we can use a non-chemical method to, um, to control these pests. Because they are, yeah, they, in, in an unmanaged orchard, they, they will just go completely rampant. So it's very important that if you are very serious about producing chestnuts commercially that you manage for this, this, this pest. They are here in New York State. I've seen them in many orchards. Um, and then, and then ask, so I'll talk a little bit more about the post-harvest sanitation, but then there's also, after you've, har after you've harvested all your chestnuts, there's a way to then ensure that if there are any eggs inside of your nuts, that um, they don't hatch. And then there's two other issues which are non, um, they're, not, they're not pests and they're not diseases, uh, so to speak, but they're issues to be careful of. One is called internal kernel breakdown, which I talked about earlier. And this is more of a genetic disorder 
um, when Euro European and Japanese hybrids are pollinated by Chinese chestnuts. And so what happens is that the nut starts to decompose, you know, before it even gets into your consumer's hand. And so far, this has only been observed for the cultivar Colossal. So as a result, I don't recommend planting Colossal, although we haven't seen this happen in New York State yet. So if you want to experiment, I also recommend experimentation. And then also sun scalds happens in orchards um, when, especially in the winter, late winter, on um, sunny days, especially with still weather, it warms up only a particular part of the tree and causes the, the, the sap to flow and to actually break apart the bark, which can rupture, you know, rupture the, the cambium. And this is very damaging to the tree. Um, but just puts it under a lot of stress, can kill your trees. And so the recommendation here is to actually paint the south and west facing portion of your trunk with white latex paint. The white paint reflects the light and reduces that temperature dif um, difference. So those are kind of the major challenges facing, um, facing chestnuts. So once you got those under control and your, your, your trees are ready to process, this is kind of a flow chart or decision tree on how to actually get your nuts from the tree to your consumer. And there's this, um, there's a series of post harvest steps that are really important. I'll go, I'll go through those um, one by one. And then you can see after you, um, after your nuts are in storage. So chestnuts, by the way, are, are very different than most of the nuts is that they're mostly starch. They actually have the same uh, nutritional breakdown um, or components so very similar to, to brown rice. And they need to be refrigerated and kept moist or they will rot. And so you need to keep them in cool storage until they reach your consumers. Um, and so, and the majority of chestnuts are, are sold fresh and, and the majority of chestnuts are eaten fresh. And so that, that's, if you go that route, you'll have a, a very little to worry about in terms of processing and equipment and, um, you know, storage facilities and things like that. But there are also other alternatives. Um, they can be these after they after the shell's been peeled, they can be frozen and sold frozen and then uh, you know boiled or reconstituted by the consumer. They can also be dried, you know, since they since they are mostly starch, they will dry very similar to like a bean or you know a kernel of corn, and then they can be ground into flour or ground it into more of a, a rough texture like a polenta, or even whole and um, sold um, like a dry bean. And then you can uh, boil them or pressure cook them and use them in soups or make um, like a mash. You know, there's many different ways. There's a, a, um, if you're really interested about all the different ways of using chestnuts, I really uh, suggest looking to different um, dishes and cuisines in Turkey and Italy, which are um, internationally, you know, huge chestnut producers and consumers. So harvesting can be done in several ways. Uh, you can harvest by hand, uh, or there's also if you know filling up in buckets, which is done very commonly. Um, hiring youth, a lot of people hire Amish or Mennonite um, workers. It's very common in the Midwest and here in New York State and Pennsylvania as well. Um, there's also more, um, you know, more mechanized or modern. I'm seeing someone's got a chat. Oh, great. Yeah, chestnut flour is delicious. It's very sweet. It's gluten-free. Um, and it's, uh, we can make a lot of different great things out, out of it. So there's more mechanized harvesters as well, which saves a lot of time. And then there's actual like machine harvesters. These are used in Italy and Turkey. This one is, uh, you have either self-propelled or also tractor pulled, different kinds. Um, but as what's common in all these is once you pick up the nuts, you have a lot of also a lot of debris in there as well. You have to separate the nuts from the debris. So after harvesting, you need to clean and sanitize your, your stock. So here are some pictures from a production facility I visited in Ohio. Um, this, this farm is part of a uh, nut producers cooperative that's also in Ohio called the Route 9 Cooperative. And, and the farmer here, Bob Stelly, you know, custom made um, a lot of his own equipment. And so it's really, really eye opening to see what you need to do or, or able to do. And here we have a large uh, bin full of nuts that then gets dropped down at a controlled rate. And this is a giant fan, which then basically 
winnows your, your crop. So it blows all the debris and then the nuts should fall free. And I can show you a video of this in action right here. So here you can see all the debris flying out from this very, very high powered fan. And then if you're able to look, um, it's kind of hard to tell, but there, you will maybe see some nuts just kind of free falling down into the bottom bin. Probably can't really see it um, in this image. And these, these large bins, once full, are moved by a forklift. So, I mean, this person had a lot of resources. And if you're just starting out, this probably isn't where you're headed. But this is, um, if you are really interested in large scale production, you know, these are ways to, to handle some of these issues. So now you have your nuts cleaned. You have them just, uh, just the nuts, none of the debris. You need to sanitize them. One, chestnuts are very perishable. You pick them up off the ground. They're, you know, they're covered in the soil mic microbes. So, and also we sanitize them to kill any kind of weevil larvae that are still inside the nut. So to do this, they're soaked at 120 degrees Fahrenheit for 20 minutes. And then you can also mix in a peroxide or peroxyacetic acid sanitizer. These, um, such as Storox, is one brand. These are um, labeled for organic use. If, if that's something you're interested in, something that I think would be great to have in New York State. Um, and here, this image here, you can see the farmer loading a, a full bin. I think this bin weighs about one ton with a forklift. And then this very controlled um, funnel lets it out into this, this white bin, which contains a sanitizing solution. So this can be uh, mechanized and automated at, you know, at large scales. So now your nuts, oops, your nuts are cleaned and sanitized. Now you need to size them and sort them. So the, your nuts are gonna create different sizes and they're often sold according to which size. Um, uh, they're often priced and priced by the size and also different kinds of people like different size nuts depending on what they're using them for. So again, here, same farm, but this is custom sort, sorting equipment. This is a rotating drum. All these holes are drilled to different sizes. Um, and here are different size categories that you can use. And here is a, what the, it looks like an action. It's on a slight incline, so the nuts travel down the hole. Um, they, they travel down, down the whole um, contraption and fall out at, um, at their correct size. And then after they've been sized, you'll want to do a final pick through. Um, to make, and so this is an example of having them on a conveyor belt, and then you can use hand labor here to pick out nuts that have um, blossom and rot, especially those um, often don't. This is the best time to kind of screen for that. You want to make sure that contaminated nuts like that don't make it into, into your consumer's hands. And then, as I said before, chestnuts are very perishable, and so they need to be, if you're going to be storing them for long periods of time, they need to be in a temperature controlled room. And here's an example at the same farm, a very large, basically walk-in refrigerator. If that refrigerator temperatures, they shouldn't be stored frozen while still in the shell, just that refrigerator temperatures. Um, from the field, they're taken, you know, after sanitized, but before, you know, if, if you have a, a lot coming in and you, just haven't had a chance to size them all or sort them yet, you can store them in these uh, eight gallon containers, uh, making sure that they're moist and cool, and then also using large sacks for actual transferring to consumers. And here's an example of the same farm, on-farm pickup um, of pre-ordered nuts. Um, when I was here, it's all different kinds of people coming from you know, multiple hours away to pick these up during harvest time. The different colored bags can be used to either denote different weights of the bag, you know, a 10 pound bag or a five pound bag, or you can also use them to denote what size nut you're using. So, you know, a purple one could be a jumbo size and the yellow could be a small size. That's really up to you, but these are kind of what's currently working. And these are um, mesh bags. So they allow a lot of breath breathability um, and you can also keep them moist in, in a cooler. And then also there's many things that you can do with, with chestnuts. So chestnuts tend to ripen in, in early to mid-October. So it's a great time to have um, a festival where you can have games and celebrations. You can do chestnut roasting on an open fire. It's a, you know, 
a, a classic in our American folklore. Um, you can, you know, direct sales are fresh chestnuts. As I said earlier, chestnuts are largely sold and eaten fresh. So very little ha you know, is required to actually get them out of your farm gate. But if you want to venture into value added products, um, making flowers is, a, uh, is, you know, a, is kind of ripe for opportunity. And there's all different kinds of recipes on the internet for actually, you know, making baked goods out of these. And they're gluten-free, uh, low in fat, if that's a concern for you, very high in vitamin C, very high in magnesium, uh, very tasty. We call this the bread tree because they're basically, you know, kernels of corn and rice just raining from the sky. And that is really the basics of chestnut production. Um, hazelnuts also found all around the world. And of the ones that are most important are these three that are in bold, Corlys avalana, Corlys americana, and Corlys cornuda. And also hazelnuts are wind pollinated and form interspecific hybrids. Um, this is just globally, the United States is very low on production, but Oregon um, makes up 99% of all of our production and they're expanding production by 8,000 acres every year. Um, in Ontario, Fur Rocher, which makes hazelnut-based chocolates, uh, just opened up a half square mile size uh, production facility. So there's really huge, huge potential for the Northeast to fill some major um, production demands. Uh, most hazelnuts end up either um, processed, um, but they can also be unprocessed as just kind of bulk nuts. And then a, a large portion also goes into creating oils. With hazelnuts, it's sort of the opposite issue of, of, um, of chestnuts, where in the Northeast we have a, we have a fungal, um, a fungus that is endemic to the region, it's native which are native hazelnuts, the Corlys americana and cornuda are naturally immune to, but their nut quality is far inferior to the, um, in terms of commercial production at least, in, in compared to the uh, Turkish or English hazelnut. Also the Turkish hazelnut is not hardy to the zones that are really relevant in uh, New York State, for the majority of New York State, and it's extremely um, Eastern filbert blight susceptible. They also tend to, they're also grown as a tree form single stem, whereas the, the, um, the native species are a multi-stem shrub. And so by cross pollinating these two, we create the hybrid hazelnut, which um, has an intermediate nut size between the, um, the native ones and the Corlys avalana. Although recent breeding, we're kind of, you know, tipping that dial more towards having the large nut size. But we're also trying to convey the shrub form, the cold hardiness, and the disease resistance. Um, like, uh, hazelnuts are really widely adapted. It can be grown on a huge variety of soils. They're very productive on marginal and, and uh, erosion-prone land, especially steep slopes. They can handle clay soils and very sandy soils, and they can survive pHs from 5.4 to 8, up to 8. Of course, you probably want to keep it more in the, you know, in the six to seven range, but they are able to withstand quite a range of pHs. You want to avoid planting things near forests because your crops will get raided by squirrels. Um, and also they really, you know, they can't handle saturated soils for prolonged time. So make sure that you do have, you know, decent drainage. And then as with chestnuts too, you'll need to protect your um, plantings with fence. We have a, another plant material considerations for, for hazelnuts. Um, if you, if you want to plant seedlings, you're going to be looking towards hybrids or just pure um, um, Americana. Very affordable. They can be free if you harvest your own nuts and plant them yourselves or just $5 a tree. And then again, just like with the chestnuts, seedlings convey lots of variability in terms of size, when they flower, how much they yield, and also disease resistance. The genetic diversity is also really important though for pollination, which I'll get into in a little bit. And then with clones, we can also, we have clones of the hybrids available. So um, there are some very, very high yielding, very productive disease resistant hybrids out there that there are clones available of, but there's also clones available of the traditional Turkish hazelnut. These are much more expensive. 
um, are more highly uniform. This 35 to 40 feet tall is for the single stem Coelus avalana. The hybrid, the multi stem shrubs can be can get up to 20 feet tall. You can see in this image, you know, these shrubs are much taller than the people um, in them. And uh, just like chestnuts, they're incompatible, so you need multiple cultivars. And um, advances in micropropagation are is like we're we have we have made advances in micropropagation on hybrid on, on um, improved hybrids that's really going to be a huge game changer for the northeast so it's a really exciting time to be interested in nut trees um, and this is an example of a um, Corliss avalana the turkish hazelnut being grown in new jersey at the rutgers university where tom molnar has made huge advances in creating disease resistant um, turkish hazelnuts for the east coast unfortunately they're not um, cold hard enough to withstand um, central New York, at least not yet. Um, for orchard management, you want to make sure that uh, irrigation happens early in establishment, but then after they're established, uh, composted wood chip mulch really does a good job um, in terms of keeping water uh, the moisture. You don't need to fertilize until after the second year. And you want to you want to constantly monitor your plants with leaf tissue analysis in J July and August. This also holds true. Most most of the nutrient management for hazelnuts translates really well to nutrient management for chestnuts. Um, and you can find a really great document out of Oregon State University. That's what this reference is. Olson 2013 um, talks about this. This uh, table shows you what your leaf should be, what your leaf nitrogen content should be. Um, and then also uh, kind of some general rules of thumb about how much to how much nitrogen to apply depending on the year, the age of the plant. You want to keep the orchard floor um, kept mowed. You can have it in grass. We want to keep our uh, you know keep uh, our soil in place and mulch mulch the weeds around trees with with wood chips. You can chestnuts. Um, I mean hazelnuts have a variety of different applications, so you can. They're really great for hedgerows and riparian buffers, and you can plant them very dense. You can, you can plant them unprotected, and you can use just seedling of Americanas or hybrid seedlings of unimproved hybrids. Um, so if you're really interested in, in water conservation and wildlife, you know, hazelnuts can be, can be a great asset on your farm. They can also be, um, you can also use the shrub form to have head, orchards basically made out of hedgerows using improved hybrids. And you can have uh, you can design this either as production or for um, you pick, and then there's also this opportunity to have single stem orchards if you're in zones six through eight. Um, you can use Corlys avalana releases by Rutgers University and also other pollinizers to make sure you have just enough pollen. Um, and this is kind of the the tree spacing you'll want to have. Very similar to the chestnut situation, you'll need multiple different um, cultivars for your production, and they need to be different cultivars because they're, incom um, they're incompatible, they're self-incompatible. And then you basically wanna surround your planting with seedlings to provide a really robust cloud of pollen. Um, hazelnuts pollinate all throughout March, and so, um, some some named cultivars will 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 produce pollen at different times within March, and so you need to make sure you just have a good overlap. And having a, a nice seedling surrounding makes sure that you have a good pollen cloud throughout the entire pollination uh, season. These are what the uh, different kinds of flowers on hazelnuts look like. Uh, the catkins release pollen. And they, they will elongate and release pollen. Before they elongate, they're very, very cold hardy, can withstand down to like negative 30 Fahrenheit. Once they're open, they're, 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 they're more susceptible, but they can still handle some sub-zero temperatures. So this is another reason why hazelnuts are really good as a climate change resilient crop, because not only do they pollinate in March when risk of, um, you know, risk of, in, of, uh, of risk of, of flower damage is already kind of low because plants are mostly dormant. These plants are already uh, naturally adapted to very cold temperatures. Um, and this is what the female flowers look like when they're fully receptive to pollen. They're very small and conspicuous. 
The most major disease for uh, hazelnuts is the eastern filbert blight. And if you choose um, time-tested material that's resistant to them, you won't really have an issue, but you should always scout for this and cull plants that, that, re that get the blight. This is what the blight looks like. It forms these little black pustules. Um, they kind of look like little tiny footballs. And you can cut off dead branches, um, or you might just need to take out the whole plant. Coralus avalana is highly susceptible, but there are, have been resistant cultivars released by the University of, of Rutgers, but these again are just really appropriate for zone six to eight, the mid-Atlantic. Here's some of the major um, insect pests for um, hazelnuts and how to manage them. So the brown marmot and stink bug is an emerging pest. It's not yet a major pest, but you can use tra traps, to, pheromone traps to monitor and control them. Uh, these samurai wasps, I don't have the scientific name for them here, but are being evaluated and showing promise as a, paras as a, a parasitoid to them, which is really great. And sunflowers are also being planted as a trap crop to attract the stink bugs outside of your orchard. Um, Japanese beetles will defoliate, um, like the, they like to chew on the leaves, and so use pheromone traps um, outside of the orchard and upwind of the orchard to make sure that none of them get inside. A big bud mite is a, it can be a problem on the west coast. It's this tiny mite that infects the dormant leaf buds and then causes them to swell and basically kills them. It's not a major pest in the east, at least yet. So be careful about buying plant material from the west um, because it's really not present west of the Rockies. But there are dormant oil sprays used um, to control this. And then there's the filbert weevil, which is also only on the west coast, um, not present here. Um, so probably only buy plant material from the east. And let's keep these pests not here if we can. And then really the, the biggest issue for, um, for hazelnuts are going to be rodents. Squirrels and chipmunks are probably the worst threats. And so you want to make sure you plant as far from the forest as you can. Um, a lot of farmers are using baited traps. They'll actually use nuts and bait and you know, use either killing traps or live traps. You can also experiment with dogs, just having dogs running around your orchard. Um, and then also blue jays and crows love hazelnuts very much, and they're very clever. Um, but there's been really good use with distress bird calls machines. Um, one uh, brand is called Bird Expeller Pro, um, and that's been uh, very useful. And then the mice and voles, you'll have to, they really do a lot of winter damage, feeding on the uh, root and stem cambium. And so make sure you protect your young trees with wire cages. Here's kind of the, um, the processing pipeline for hazelnuts, uh, especially for culinary markets. The asterisk here is there because there's also a lot of potential for hazelnuts to be uh, useful in the biofuel um, industry. Hazelnuts are between 50 and 75% oil. This is a lot higher oil content than soybeans, and so they actually can produce a lot more oil per acre than soybeans could. So there's also um, industrial applications for hazelnuts. But it's a, lot, it's a little bit simpler um, up front for hazelnuts. You just need to harvest, dry, and then de-husk them. And then you have a bunch of options in terms of how you want to sell. So you can sell the, sh the, the nuts in shell, um, which is the cheapest to produce. You also get the lowest price per nut. It's about $250 to $350 per pound, um, uh, $2.50, $3.50 per pound. Um, and these can be sold directly to the industry and they'll do all the cracking, sorting, and processing. Um, however, all that machinery in the industry is really designed for Corliss Avalana. So if you're using hybrid plant material, you may have trouble finding industry buyers. You can also directly sell to consumers. I'm, I'm not sure how much consumers want to crack their own nuts. Um, it may be kind of a novelty at holiday times, but it may not be really a good um, marketing strategy year round. You can then also separate different, uh, crack and separate the, the shells and use them in different ways. And so you can press, if you, um, are limited or lazy or challenged to actually separate the, the nuts 100% from the kernels. You can have a mixture of shells and, and nut meats and actually press for oil, very high quality, delicious, nutritious, amazing oil. Um, it, I think it's, it has a huge potential. 
You can also separate um, all the kernels out 100% and then sell to food producers, um, either wholesale, you know, like, you know, for granolas and nut butters and confections and spreads, things kind of like that. So um, things in this square require a lot more um, capital expense upfront, but you also get um, a lot of return and high value products. So how to get your, your nuts from the field to heart to the consumer. First, you need to harvest. Um, so you can do uh, hand harvesting on the shrubs. This can be challenging if the shrubs are very tall. And also if you're planting on broad acres, you know, hand harvesting really quickly becomes not very economical. So there's also, um, um, so if you're using hybrid, hybrid forms, there's two different kinds of machineries people are experimenting with, and I want to stress experimenting with. This is a uh, tractor-driven aronia berry harvester, and it basically, um, it takes the, the shrub, bends it over, and kind of whacks the nuts um, off of it, and then captures them. As you'll see here, you can um, see there, it's very aggressively um, shaking the branches and then pulling, it separates the, the husks out and then drops them into, um, you know, these, these uh, on-farm bins for collection for then further processing. You can see that it does bring a lot of stem and leaf material, so you do, you do do some damage to your shrubs that way. Um, and then another option, this is an over-the-row blueberry harvester. Just want to turn the volume down. And these just can drive right over your rows. And they have these paddles that kind of massage the, um, the shrubs and whack off all the, 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 um, the clusters. It can handle very tall um, plants, which is really great. And again, unfortunately, it's, these are really uh, still experimental phase. This is the blueberry harvester, very expensive. Um, but promising. And then if you're using a single stem planting, uh, Coros avalana has this uh, tendency to actually, the nuts will fall to the ground on the right. Whereas the uh, hybrids, the nuts will stay on the bush. So that's kind of one of the, the, the management differences between the two. And so you can actually vacuum them off the ground or use a mechanical sweeper, very much like the, in the chestnut example. So these different ways of harvesting. And then as far as, as yields go, um, can't see my notes, so I'm having trouble remember the exact figures, but you can expect about between two and 3,000 pounds per acre. And if you think about that, selling them at 250 to $350 per pound, um, you can expect anywhere between like five to $8,000 roughly per acre. Um, so, and it's about five to $6,000 per acre to establish them. So, you know, in one year, in one really good year, after you get to full production potential, you'll have paid for your kind of your beginning upfront costs. After you harvest them, you need, you need to dry the nuts, dehusk them, clean and sort them. And you can dry them in a number of ways. Easiest ways is in a greenhouse on flat beds. Um, you, if that takes about two weeks to dry them to about 6% um, moisture content. Um, at small scales, you can dehusk them with this uh, DIY bucket dehusker called just, just Google Don Price bucket dehusker. Um, and it, uh, you can you know, make it yourself. It's worked really well for low volumes. And there's also um, lots of schematics online for um, husk aspirators. So this, after you have knocked all the husks off, you then have husks and nuts together. You want to separate the nuts out. Um, so this machine does that. Um, there's also uh, Italian built machines that are PTO driven um, that will do all this for you in one step. Of course, very expensive. And then just like with chestnuts, you want to sort them by size. This is a DIY farm scale size sorter. It's like a large PVC pipe with these um, holes drilled in it of these different size classes. So it very, works on the exact same principle as the, um, in the chestnut example. So after, now you just have your clean nuts, but they're still in the shell. You need to sort, you need to crack this. If you want to, you need to crack the shell and extract the kernel. Um, this is a really good um, hand-powered cracker. It costs $200, cracks nuts reliably of all different kinds. 
labor intensive, very slow. Um, with more capital investment, you can invest in, you know, um, high powered machines. And then at Rutgers, this is an example of once your nuts have been cracked, you need to sort the shells separately from the kernels themselves. And here's an example of a machine that does that, also Italian made, it uses these crescent moon shaped cuts and it, uh, the, the um, nut shells slip out. Um, you can see them there just falling out. And then um, this shoot here, all the nut shells go and this shoot here comes out the kernels by themselves. And then again, um, we call this the butter bush because it's extremely rich in oil. Um, and so here are just over, overview of some of the applications. You could do pick your own, you could sell them in shell or, and have people crack them at home. Or you could sell them already cracked and sorted in bulk or in pieces for granola and confections. And of course, there's a ton of different kinds of value added products from butters to oils, um, nut spreads and flours you can make. And then um, I don't have time to go into this. this is a whole other exciting area, but there's also other nut trees that are really useful, um, such as the bitter nut hickory, which makes an amazing oil. Um, and acorns can be, um, can be turned into flour. And so there's also a huge potential for other kinds of tree crops to be explored in New York State. Um, this company, uh, this project, the Acornucopia project, is a project of the Nutty Buddy Collective in Asheville, North Carolina, and they're doing a lot of really exciting things with expanding tree crops and using these forced uh, nut producing trees um, and creating a whole new industry in, uh, for food. It's, it's really exciting. And so in the Northeast, this is um, kind of a map I'm putting together of who is growing and who are going nuts, uh, so to speak. We have a lot of different um, uh, like research institutional partners, um, all working, doing great things um, from the upper Midwest, from all the way from the upper Midwest to Missouri, um, to Rutgers and Cornell, all of us are working on different aspects of, of nut production. So it's really exciting. It's a really, really exciting time um, to be getting interested in nut trees, especially um, with this particular group, the New York Tree Crops Alliance, um, who are a, a producers cooperative in central New York, um, very close to um, Ithaca and Dryden area, Cortland. Um, who have already formed and incorporated a producer's cooperative solely for the purpose of the sustainable production of nut trees in New York State. Um, and over here, this graph is just a, uh, uh, some preliminary results from a survey that I'm doing for my research. And it's basically showing that New York State growers are more optimistic about nut production state than cooperative extension agents are. So the moral of the story here is if you're interested in producing nuts, Talk to your extension educators. They need to hear from you. They're, they're here to help you. Um, and they will help drive the research and extension programs going forward. So if, if growers in New York State want to get more support, um, you know, talk to us. We, we, we're here to help you. We, we want to know that you're excited about growing nuts. The New York Tree Cops Alliance is um, currently seeking membership. So if you're interested in learning more about them, head to nytca.org. Um, and they have amazing growers on their team with, with over decades and decades of experience of both on-farm breeding and selection. Some of the greatest plant material that we have available to us is coming from this group. Um, it's, it's, a, it's really exciting to be working with them. Here's an example of, they just got a hazelnut, uh, a, um, an oil press, commercial oil press, and here we are pressing hazelnut oil, literally liquid gold. Um, so exciting things are coming down the pike. And then I just, this, this came really briefly through my email today. Um, one of our, you know, collab, not, not, not formal collaborator, but one of our, you know, movement collaborators out in the Midwest, the Savannah Institute just was awarded $250,000 from the nature conservancy to help, um, help support farmers in planting tree crops because uh, 
the financial upfront cost of doing this is often a barrier to actually people starting. So here we have a, a grant to help seed more people planting nut trees in the Midwest. And so hoping to have, uh, and this is this graph here comes from the Nature Conservancy study. Um, these are natural climate solutions, something I referenced earlier in the presentation and how um, these are, these are land-based methods that we can reach um, climate, climate change mitigation and nut trees can be a really essential part of this. We can, we can reforest the land with, with trees that produce food. And we can um, also do um, you know, alley cropping, which has a very large um, climate change mitigation potential compared to some of these other agricultural improvements. So this is really exciting from one of our uh, exciting news from a neighboring region. And with that, I'm really grateful for all of you who stayed on um, through this extra long webinar. Um, Here's a, I'm really grateful to my financial sponsors for the, my research. If you'd like to get in touch with me, uh, here's my email, uh, sfb42 at cornell.edu. And I'm also on social media at Research is Nuts. I'm all on um, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And I just want to thank you so much for your attention and your interests. I also just want to say briefly that I don't have a resource sheet available at this moment, but I'm going to get it up very soon and I'll send it to everyone here, which will include um, links to um, not only the scientific studies, but also um, uh, like really good nurseries and plant material um, directories, things like that. So with that, um, thank you so much. Sam, do you have um, a couple minutes if there's any questions? Absolutely, yes. Great. Um, there is a question from Barbara. Um, it, can you share your thoughts on the ESF genetically modified American chestnuts? Sure. I, um, and I'm, I'm sharing my, my perspective as someone who's not detailedly involved in their, in their program. Um, and I guess, so there's lots of thoughts. Um, it's a very complicated, it's a very complex issue. The, the, the program at ESF, what they're doing is they have found that there is a very simple solution to the chestnuts fending off um, the chestnut blight. And, all, and what they have discovered is that um, there is a gene in many plants which produces um, an enzyme that breaks down oxalic acid. So what the, the, the chestnut blight produces oxalic acid inside the tissue of the plant. And that basically just dissolves the plants, um, you know, the, the plant material. It dissolves the wood, dissolves the, the lignin and the cellulose. And the tree has no, the, the chestnut tree has no defense against it because it doesn't have the enzyme to break down oxalic acid. Other plants like rice and, uh, and many others do have this gene. So what ESF did was they, they used, um, very time-tested, you know, transgenic technology to take the gene from, uh, I'm not sure if they used a rice plant, but rice was a, a model plant that has the same gene. They inserted that singular gene, it's just one singular gene into the genome of the chestnut. Um, the, the transformed chestnut was able to, okay, it was a wheat plant, thank you. Um, and that, chestnut was now able to produce the enzyme to break down oxalic acid. That, 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 um, that gene transformation has been shown to be uh, able to be inherited to future generations. Um, if crossed with a wild chestnut, it's a 50% you know, in chance of inheritance. Um, so I think if you bred two transformed chestnuts together, you'd probably have 100% inheritance of that gene. Um, and that's, and it's a very simple transformation. So uh, one thing that I really appreciate about what ESF has been doing is that they're not interested in, um, they're not interested in patenting, patenting this technology. They want it to be open to, to the public, to, to reforestation efforts. And so they're, unlike many other transgenic technologies, which do, which, which are patented, um, this is supposed to be kind of open source. In, in a sense. So 
I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to say whether or not it's good or bad. I think it's, it's really interesting and, and has really powerful implications for reforestation. It's currently in uh, a really intense review from the FDA and USDA in terms of human and environmental safety. Um, so that's kind of, I feel like the, the most that I can share my thoughts. I encourage you to learn more about it. Um, yeah. And it looks like there is someone from the botany club, the ESF botany club, and uh, remarked that that um, the team might have been from a wheat plant, but um, I, I'm not positive about that. So it, maybe we can get some more information and share it with you folks if you're interested. And I'll reach out to the ESF folks if that's of interest to this group. But I thank you, Sam. Yeah. One other question about site selection mm -hmm. from Jake. And I don't know if you can read that. Yeah, yeah, I'm reading it. Okay, so let's see. We have a field that is seasonally wet for Jenny Sinny. Yeah, so, I, so, so these trees can, can handle seasonal wetness. It's just really like um, really long-term flooding or like sat soils that are um, habitually saturated that, are, that will cause problems. All right, great. Um, do we have any other questions before we sign off? Uh, this is a really exciting, um, I, I also want to uh, let folks know that if they're in the Washington County, maybe Northern Rensselaer County area, um, at the Ag Stewardship Association in the Eastern New York uh, region has been working with um, Jared Woodcock, who I think is also in this, uh, he's listening in, and they have been doing some work with nut tree plantings uh, for forest regeneration and for crops. And so there's another supportive group out there. Um, so if you have further questions, you can work through the Eastern New York horticulture folks, or you can maybe reach out to ASA, or you can reach out to Sam, but there um, are going to be there's lots of resources and people to help with questions. Okay? Okay. Thank you so much for your, your um, really great presentation. I appreciate it. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. And thank you all for listening in.